think it's time we get started. Uh, we are thrilled to roll out the latest episode of the Quantum Seminar series dedicated to the research and academic quantum communities. This seminar takes place every Friday at noon Eastern time and will be hosted on the Kiskin YouTube channel. So you can always go back and rewatch uh, these videos. I'm your host, Life Kuminev from IBM Quantum Research. And today I have the uh, absolute pleasure and privilege of hosting Lee Martin, Harvard Quantum Initiative HQI Fellow and postdoc in the Luke and Park groups, uh, who will talk about implementation of a canonical phase measurement with quantum feedback. And hello, Lee, how are you today? Doing great. Really happy to be here. Yeah, thanks for accepting the invitation. I think last time you and I saw each other was at a last March meeting, which was cut rather short. Uh, so it's a pleasure that I do get to hear your talk. Where are you tuning in from today, Lee? Uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. I'm actually just right down the street from campus. All right, well, greetings from New York. Lee is uh, an HKI fellow, as I mentioned, and previously he was a research assistant at Agila, and he did his PhD with Irfan Siddiqui at UC Berkeley. So we share that ancestry. Uh, so Lee, I think it's time we jump right into your talk. Okay, well, I'm really excited to be a part of this and to get to talk with all of you from not just IBM, but apparently all over the world. That's really neat to have such a broad audience. Um, so I'll be talking about some of the work that I did in my PhD working on superconducting circuits, which is the kind of technology that Zlatko also works with. Um, not focused so much on quantum computing, but actually on the fundamental limits of measurement in quantum systems. And so I'll first talk a little bit about what kinds of measurement capabilities you have in superconducting circuits, and then explain some kind of new capabilities that we developed over the course of, of my work there. So a little bit of background and kind of the overarching motivation for what I, what I did, um, what we did, I should say, is the kinds of measurements that one can do of an optical field. So imagine you have a signal, maybe it's encoded in a laser beam or a microwave or a radio signal, um, and you wanted to send information with that, or you wanted to sort of measure something that is emitting that kind of radiation. Um, to, to sort of do anything as best as you can, you want to understand what the quantum limit of that thing is, because ultimately reality is dictated by quantum mechanics, and quantum mechanics actually sets very stringent limits on how well certain properties can be measured. So for instance, if you want to talk about power, like how bright is my beam, um, there's an associated quantum mechanical operator associated with power, usually written like this, and it's essentially going to count the number of individual light quanta or photons in your beam. Um, and, a, and a really remarkable thing uh, coming out of you know, 20th century physics is that we can build devices that can measure light power at the fundamental limit allowed by quantum mechanics. This is a picture actually that we found in the e-waste bin because these things are so common these days of a photon counter module that can count individual quanta of light. And these exist at many different frequencies now, and this is a fairly standard device that's used all over the place. Now, in quantum mechanics, there's this notion of measurement basis. If I measure how much power is in a light beam, I'm actually missing out on the opportunity to learn about other information. And there's another uh, sort of related quantity to power that's actually fundamentally different called amplitude. And you can think of this not in terms of the number of photons in a light beam, but if, if you imagine light more as a wave, then the amplitude of a light wave is going to amp measure sort of what's the, the difference between the hike, the, the peak and the crest of a wave, or the peak and the trough of a wave. So, uh, and now there's, there's sort of different phases with which you can measure the amplitude. You can sort of measure, is the wave oscillating like this, or maybe it shifted a little bit back and forth, and those are actually fundamentally different measurements. But either way, you can measure those properties as well at the fundamental limit allowed by quantum mechanics using a device called a Holmodyne detector, or as I'll talk about later, a parametric amplifier. Um, and I've drawn a picture here, but kind of just the point that I wanna make is there's also quantum mechanical operators associated with those properties of light called field quadratures that I'll be talking about a lot. And we can essentially, up to technical imperfections, like maybe you have a little bit of loss, maybe there's some noise, but sort of as far as the in principle questions are concerned, we can measure these properties as well as quantum mechanics allows. Now there's one other really important property of light that hasn't been mentioned yet, and that's called the phase. And you know, in the analogy of, of a light wave as an actual wave, like a ripple propagating in a medium, um, phase is measuring where sort of where in space or where in time is the crest of the wave occurring. Um, and that's an angular variable. You can think of it as going between zero and 360 degrees as the wave sort of shifts by one wavelength. 
Um, and there's actually not at the moment a device, even in principle, that can measure phase at the fundamental limit allowed by quantum mechanics. But it's actually no less important than the other properties that I have listed here on this slide. So kind of the overarching goal of this project and what I'm going to work towards throughout these slides is asking, can we build a device that even in principle could measure the quantum mechanical limit for the precision of a phase measurement? Now, what would it actually mean to measure phase at that limit? Well, it turns out that because phase is an angular variable, there's some kind of technical details that prevent you from being able to write down sort of a standard projective measurement. Um, so in quantum mechanics, you sort of at the undergraduate level, you think about measurements happening where you, you look at a qubit and you measure and you either get a zero or a one or nothing in between. Um, and you, you can actually associate an operator with that. Um, with phase, there are some subtleties that prevent you from doing that directly, but you can nevertheless define with complete lack of ambiguity what it would mean to perform an ideal phase measurement. And this is called a canonical phase measurement. And essentially what you imagine doing is you write down first a bunch of states that, are, that we're going to call phase states. And they're a uniform superposition over all different numbers of photon. But we weight each photon number by a complex phase factor that tells you sort of what angle if you, if you imagine uh, light waves in the IQ plane, for those of you who are familiar with that, what angle is that vector making that describes the light wave? Or as far as waves are concerned, just sort of what is the phase shift of that wave as it propagates? Um, an interesting thing about this that you'll immediately notice is because this is a uniform superposition over all photon number states, a measurement in this basis has no idea how many photons are in the field. Um, so what it means to do a measurement in this basis is we're just going to take an arbitrary input state rho. So this is just representing the quantum state of the thing that we want to measure, maybe the light beam. Um, and we're just going to compute the probability that if you were to measure in this basis, you would get this outcome theta. And by the, this property here that I'm summing over all n, um, you'd say that this is actually canonically conjugate to power. So just in the sense that the Heisenberg uncertainty principle says that you know, if you measure position, then you know nothing about momentum. If you measure momentum, you know nothing about position. Um, there's actually a corresponding relation between phase and power, um, which actually suggests a way to, to measure phase that I'll get to later. But first, I want to clear up some uh, so sort of the many ways in which people talk about phase measurement in the quantum field. So some of you might have heard of phase estimation as a, as a metrology problem. And there are certain things that one considers in the problem of phase estimation that aren't allowed in the kind of setting that I'm describing here. So as a reminder, I'm, I'm imagining we're given a single copy of a quantum state, and we're going to try to measure the phase of that state, some light wave, as best as we can. However, when you think about phase estimation as a quantum metrology problem, a lot of times people will talk about, well, maybe I'm given some state and I can apply a phase shift multiple times. So I sort of shift my light wave by little increments over and over again. That's not a capability that we're kind of allowing ourselves to use here because we only have, you know, the phase is encoded in the state and not in some operator. And consequently, we're also not allowed the ability to like take our state and apply it through multiple passes of some phase shift at a time. Because again, that, you know, that involves encoding the information inside an operation that we do on our light wave instead of just doing something on light wave itself. So as far as like phase estimation is a general problem in quantum mechanics is concerned, the only like remaining tool in our toolbox that is standard in phase estimation is an adaptive measurement. So we're given one copy of our state and we better do a really good measurement because we only get one shot at it. So let's figure out the best way possible to do a measurement. And in order to understand what's the best thing that you can do, what's the best choice that I can make for measurement device to get phase, we actually have to think about measurement very differently from how it's normally thought of in like at least an undergraduate quantum mechanics treatment. So the and, first step uh, is to think about what quick, is the measurement. Sorry, quick question um, on the previous slide. You mm -hmm. maybe you sort of alluded to this, but you know, you write this uh, bra cat uh, or cat bra of theta, this this uh, angle state. But mm -hmm. you know, there's a, there's a lot of uh, I don't know how important here the subtleties are related to what that even means, uh, what a phase state means for something like a harmonic oscillator versus a qubit. Uh, I don't know if we need to get into that here, but um, I thought I would just raise that point for any of those wondering. 
Yeah, that's a very good point. So I guess that's more of a, a technical point and something that I'm kind of brushing over here. Um, but since I'm talking about light waves, we, we can think of this perfectly well as doing a phase measurement on a single harmonic oscillator. And maybe an important detail to note is that means that this n value is counting numbers of photons and has to be positive. It turns out that if n could run from minus infinity to infinity, um, there actually wouldn't be a lot of the subtleties associated with phase measurements that I'm talking about here. So you can think of this for all intents and purposes as doing a phase measurement on a harmonic oscillator. Though in practice, when I start talking about experimental implementations, then I think the interesting thing is that we're doing this on a traveling light wave. So it could sort of be any, any input state that you care to think about. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. Also, I think I, I meant to mention this earlier, but it's, it's very easy when you're giving a, an online or a Zoom seminar to just keep barreling on. Um, so it's, it's very much appreciated to have questions from the audience. And please, Zlatko, interrupt me when, when people have any more. Yeah, and folks, feel free to post them in the chat box. So another, you know, sort of an interesting question that comes up in quantum mechanics is what's what's the right way to think about measurement? And I would actually argue that the standard way we're taught about it at the undergraduate level is not quite the, the full story. And to at least understand the kind of work that we're doing here, um, you need to understand what a weak measurement is. So what does it mean to measure something incompletely? And a, a simple example of that is called the stern gerlach experiment. This turns out to be a really nice test bed for understanding weak measurement. So imagine I have like a silver atom here, and it has two internal states, 0 or 1, which you can imagine as being like an electron being spin up or spin down, one of the electrons in the orbitals of the silver atom. If you send this atom through a magnetic field gradient, it gets a little kick. The magnetic field will sort of push the atom up if it's in the 0 state or down if it's in the 1 state. And then imagine we put a screen here that tries to measure the position of the atom. So if I plot like a histogram, of what the distribution of outcomes look like. There's sort of a blob where it gets pushed up if it was in the zero state and another if it gets pushed down in the one state. Then I could just make histograms if I do this many, many times of how many counts do I get at each position. And an interesting thing to note is that, you know, this atom is a quantum mechanical object. Its position is not perfectly well determined. And so there's actually some fundamental uncertainty in the position of the atom when you measure it that actually comes from just the fact that the atom doesn't have a well-defined position in the first place. This broadness is not just an uncertainty in the measurement device, but a fundamental uncertainty from quantum mechanics. But nevertheless, you know, we can, we can make statements about the spin state of the atom based on what we see here, even though these distributions are broad. So for instance, if I measure in a particular instance that the atom was here, I know, well, it's very unlikely that it was in the, in the red state, because if it was in the red state, I should have seen it over here. But that means it must have been in the blue state, and consequently, it must have been in the one state. And so you'd find if you like went in and looked at the spin of the atom after doing this process that the uh, the qubit had been projected into the one state. So we're no longer say in a superposition of zero and one if that's what we started with, but we're only in one. And by the same logic, if I if I wind up finding the atom way way up here, then I know well it's very unlikely it was in the blue state, so it must be in zero. But generically, you can get measurement outcomes in the middle. And if you'll notice, these are, these are kind of indeterminate because the atom could have been in the zero state or the one state. Um, and, and there's nothing else in the universe could know, actually. You know, this uncertainty in the measurement outcome isn't just noise on our apparatus. It's something fundamental about the atom. And consequently, there's no way that we can know with certainty what state the atom is in. And instead of writing what happens to the system as a function of a projection operator, we can write down a more general operator um, related to what are called measurement operators or POVMs, they kind of take into account this fundamental uncertainty that is really present in any measurement if you think about it. No device can tell you with 100% certainty anything. Um, but nevertheless, there, there's nothing terribly mysterious about this. We can write down an operator that will project you sort of halfway up or halfway down. Now you might say that's kind of a contrived system. What does that have to do with a real measurement? Um, in real measurements, it's actually even more natural to think not just about a weak measurement, but about a continuous measurement. So I'm going to consider the same scenario here. I imagine the atom is starting out in a superposition of 0 and 1. And now I have a bunch of degrees of freedom here. And I could imagine um, maybe these are sort of spins or other atoms in a material. Um, maybe these are like individual photons interacting with the atom. There's actually a bunch of, of scenarios in which a model, of like a, a realistic model of measurement is relevant here. And what I imagine is that 
instead of sort of sending the atom through and interacting once with the magnetic field, it's going to interact many, many times. First, it interacts with this atom, but it's very, very weak. And so those histograms of measurement outcomes mostly overlap. There's a lot of sort of effective quantum noise on this. And I don't learn a lot if I were to go in and measure this spin about the state of this spin. But if I let this happen over and over again, then I will gradually accumulate more and more information about the state of the atom. And if you take the continuum limit where each, each of these degrees of freedom here learns an infinitesimal amount of information about this atom, but I do this an infinite number of times, you can actually derive a, a differential equation or a continuous equation of motion for the behavior of a quantum system under the process of measurement. So what's cool about this is it's very different from thinking about measurement as an instantaneous wave function collapse. We actually sort of bring measurement back into the fold of physics where we talk about things always with differential equations and things evolving continuously. Um, and the actual details of this equation aren't too important, but for those who are familiar with this formalism, this curly D here is often written as a curly L. That's just like the Lindblad dephasing operator. And this curly H here is describing sort of the intrinsic quantum noise of the measurement um, that's going to give us update about the, the information that we're learning about our quantum state. So that's kind of enough to understand, actually. I would argue most measurements that we encounter in real oh, estate sorry, not to interrupt you, I was just going to say maybe a, a kind of an interesting point to differentiate the row that you, you're referring to here versus the usual density matrix that we write down is that this is this is really a special one. It's conditioned on on the measurement record. I thought maybe I should just underscore that. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. Um, and you know that's the reason why you might be familiar, or like most people are are more likely to be familiar with this first part of the equation. Because that's sort of what happens when you have an atom interacting with a bath, but nobody goes and measures the bath afterwards. And then you see this equation of motion will take a pure quantum state where you know the information, and the information gets lost to the bath and you never see it again. And this operator is essentially bringing that information back because you measure the bath. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the clarification on that. So. The example that's relevant to the work I'll talk about today is, is an adaptive measurement. And this is something that you really only get to talk about when you think about continuous and weak measurements. What we're going to imagine is you can actually change your measurement basis during the process. So motivated by our final scenario, imagine I have a single atom, and it's interacting with the electromagnetic field. So even though an atom's sitting in vacuum, you, you actually are interacting that atom with something. It's interacting with the electromagnetic field in empty space. And you can break that field up into individual little mo temporal modes that you can imagine like flying past the atom and interacting with it one by one by one. And it's very similar to this scenario here of having a bunch of degrees of freedom interact with the atom one by one by one. And, you know, at a, at a given instant in time, maybe a mode comes, it interacts, and then we put a detector here. So I just put like a photon counter or some kind of black magic box that's going to detect this outcoming field. And that will implement a single instance of this equation here that I wrote on the previous slide. And I learned some information. And now what if I change my detector before this next mode of the electromagnetic field comes? And I learned something. And now what if I change to a different detector? But which detector I choose depends on the measurement outcome on the previous two cases. That's essentially what an, ad an adaptive measurement is. And as you can maybe see, there's going to be a lot more types of measurements that we can build up when we allow our sale, uh, ourselves this capability. You know, um, I'm not going to be able to write this as a projective measurement in general, because I might be learning information about different non-commuting operators at different times. And so this general question of what new operators can you measure if you allow for adaptive measurement is actually a pretty big and, and fairly open question in the field once you start restricting to certain types of measurements. So. You know, people have done adaptive measurements before, and there's some pretty interesting theoretical scenarios in which people have found that they're they're pretty important. So there's something called the Dolinar receiver that lets you discriminate between different coherent states. People have shown various instances where you can use adaptive measurement to actually steer a quantum system toward a desired state. And of course, the, the example that I'm going to be talking about here, if that's not clear already, is I'm going to argue that adaptive measurements let you do sort of one of the best measurements of phase allowed by quantum mechanics. So that connects these, these first two sections that I've been talking about so far. Now, as I've been alluding, you know, people have people have certainly done measurements of phase before, and there are there are standard techniques. One is one is called heterodyne detection, 
also, uh, you know, for our superconducting circuit people, like a tupa or a parametric amplifier operating in phase uh, preserving mode, those also measure phase, but they're approximate measurements of phase. And effectively what they do is they take a quadrature measurement and they just rotate that quadrature rapidly in time. So you're, you're effectively like sampling all possible phases of the light field and getting a pretty good guess as to what the phase of the field is. And people have done other things to try to go beyond heterodyne detection. People have done versions of, of single shot and multi-shot adaptive measurements to try to approach the quantum limit. Um, people have also used entangled states for very related problems. And all of these things can in principle do better than heterodyne detection. Um, but, but two important caveats is that most of these schemes, all of these schemes tend to work worse at low photon numbers. Um, and that's really the, the situation in which the intrinsic quantum mechanical uncertainty is largest. So that's when you actually care the most about hitting the quantum limit. Um, and, and sort of a, a related fact is that they'll, they'll intrinsically acquire photon number information. So when you, when you do a measurement like this, you're not just going to learn about phase, what you want, but you'll learn about other quantities about which you don't want to learn. So the goal of the following project is going to be twofold. One is to just perform a canonical phase measurements at all. Um, at least at the single photon level. And second is going to be to try to use this formalism of continuous measurement that I introduced to validate the detector and really make sure in a precise way that it's doing exactly the measurement that we think it's doing. All right, so finally getting to some experimental detail. So the abstract setup of our project is the following. We just imagine we have uh, at a high level a transmitter and a receiver. And the transmitter is going to try to communicate uh, a continuous variable between 0 and 2 pi or 0 and 360 degrees encoded in a phase. So the way we do this is we prepare an atom in a superposition of its ground and excited states, but we have a relative phase between G and E. And then we just induce that atom to spontaneously emit that photon into a transmission line. And so this is the signal that it, it's the challenge of the receiver to figure out what this phase chi is over here. So the receiver in practice is going to be a, a quadrature detector, but we're going to allow this phase here to, um, to vary in time in an arbitrarily complicated way. Now, if I were just to let this phase stay fixed, that's called a, what that turns out to be equivalent to is called a homodyne detection. Um, and so I'm essentially like, you can imagine this detector is just picking a phase and guessing like, okay, well, I hope, I hope the true phase is approximately close to one of the phases that I, that I picked. Um, and you actually do find, you know, you learn phase information about the state that way. And there's a sense in which this is a, an 80% efficient phase measurement. And what that means in precise terms is that it's going to give you, it's going to tell you what the true phase of the photon was 80% of the time, but 20% of the time it's going to output a random number that has nothing to do with the true input state. Now, if I let this phase rotate rapidly in time, that becomes a heterodyne measurement, and that bumps this efficiency up to 89%. Um, but, you know, even if I make this detector perfectly, I don't have any experimental imperfections, I'm still not measuring phase with a 100% success rate. And this is where adaptive measurement comes in. So imagine now that we're allowed to tune this phase variable as a function of time, however we like. So I'm going to draw the phase variable in the IQ plane. So you can imagine like zero is this way, 90 degrees is this way, and the arrow rotates around here. And that describes the phase. And the green arrow is going to represent the true phase that we want to learn. And this black arrow here is going to kind of try to tr depict what is our current state of knowledge about the phase. Like, what's our best guess? So at the first time instant when this photon is arriving, just imagine like a tiny portion of this photon has hit the detector, but most of it is still flying through space toward the detector. Um, I don't know anything about the phase, so I just pick an arbitrary valuable for the detector, a quadrature. So that's this red line here. Now, after a little bit of the photon has arrived, I learn something about the phase. It's either I get a positive signal, which indicates that my photon is probably aligned with the measurement axis, or I get a negative signal, which indicates that probably the photon is anti-aligned with the measurement axis. So in this case, I imagine I got a slight positive signal. So now I know something. At this point, if I don't change my phase axis and I just keep measuring in the same basis, well, that's homodyne detection. And the reason this is only 80% efficient is that now I start learning about amplitude information. You know, if I keep measuring in this basis, I know my photon is pointed roughly this way, and now I'm gonna start learning about how long this vector is, which tells me something about the amplitude of the single or the number of photons in the single. And I don't wanna do that because these are canonically conjugate variables. The more I learn about one, the less I learn about the other. 
So the best thing I can do is actually to rapidly rotate my measurement basis based on the information I just learned and try to maintain that measurement axis to be orthogonal to the best estimate of the state. And now if I get a fluctuation, that doesn't tell me about the length of the vector, but it tells me about how good my guess was. So a positive fluctuation is more likely to happen here, which is, oh, it's probably not aligned along this axis, but it's tilted up a little bit. And if I just keep rotating that phase to try to track the best estimate here, um, it turns out that I, I can actually suppress the amount to which I learned photon number information. And you can implement exactly a canonical phase measurement in the single photon subspace. So and that's kind of the abstract the... version of this. So if there are any questions about that before I proceed. Sounds like we have oh, one minute. Oh, never mind. I think I just saw it. Uh, you, you say that, yes, the, the expectation is that you could do this with 100% efficiency. Um, That's right. So yes, yeah. E even if it, so you do have to have an estimate to begin with, right? And if your estimate is wildly off, no. So that's the beauty of this. I, I didn't illustrate this here, but it's sort of the the zeroth time when none of the photon has arrived at the detector. Um, I should I should draw like an arrow of zero length here. So so the detector has no idea what the phase of the photon is, and so it just picks. Uh, that axis arbitrarily. Mm -hmm. And this is actually something that distinguishes this work from a lot of other phase estimation work, where you kind of linearize things by assuming that you roughly know the phase, and then you just your measurement is only refining your best estimate. Mm -hmm. We'd say, I don't know anything. Mm -hmm. I see. So if they begin orthogonal, then it's the quantum noise. It's the quantum noise that would push you to one side, and you would quickly see that okay, this is not the side, so you'd go over to the right side. Um, I see. I think it makes yeah, sense. so I mean the the black arrow right is not is not the true. So if this if this green arrow were along here, you'd still do the same thing at early times because there's very little difference. But as you learn more and more information, you'd find your measurement axis will naturally, if you do this right, will end up orthogonal to the true state. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and someone from the audience is asking if you provide a reference um, or I, the talk will stay live and. I think you have probably a reference to the paper somewhere in your talk, so we'll probably wait to get to that. Yeah, I think I might have one at the end, but um, if you want to look it up, the, the I, think, I believe the title of this talk is actually the same as the current paper. It should be available freely in archive. Great, thank you. Hmm. Okay, so now that I've introduced the, the experiment in abstract terms, I want to give a couple quick I mean, slides. I might terms. skip some of these in the interest of time because I've been going a bit slower. But I at least want to make sure we have a, a good sense of like concretely, what are the actual physical things you could hold in your hand that implement this protocol that I just described with only our cartoon images so far. So our good friends at IBM are very familiar with this machine here. This is called the dilution refrigerator. And it's capable of bringing things down to a temperature of only 30 millikelvins. So that's 100 times colder than outer space, which I've always found to be pretty incredible. And you need to go to these really low temperatures to start doing quantum optics, so dealing with individual quantum degrees of freedom in the microwave domain. And if you zoom in on this fridge on the other side, there's a little metal box. And instead, that little metal box is a little sapphire chip. And printed on that chip are some blocks of metal that actually form a superconducting qubit. And I won't, I won't belabor this too much, but essentially, a qubit is a capacitor and a nonlinear inductor, um, which, if it were a linear inductor, would just form an LC circuit. but with this nonlinearity here becomes a nonlinear harmonic oscillator where you can do all sorts of, of tricks to generate to create um, both qubits and parametric amplifiers, which are the, the workhorses that I'll get to shortly. So my, my one slide crash course on this is that if we have a, a nonlinear circuit and we have it only being weakly nonlinear, or we have it being strongly nonlinear, excuse me, um, you imagine starting out with a harmonic oscillator with equally spaced levels, which would be the case in which this is linear. But if we make it strongly nonlinear, then the spacing between these levels becomes very, very different. And I can actually address just one level individually without hitting all the others. And that's the essence of a transmon qubit. And the point of this talk is we'll just be addressing the two lowest levels to form our atom, which we can use to create our photon. And then at the other limit, I think I'll end up skipping over this. But if you make this thing very weakly uh, anharmonic, then it becomes a nonlinear oscillator, which uh, even, even classically, um, people think about parametric amplifications and duffing oscillators. So it turns out that if you pump this thing really strongly, um, it can take a signal, it can amplify it. 
Um, and how are we doing on time? I think maybe I'll maybe actually we'll spend just a second talking about this because this is some really nice intuitive physics. So imagine we have a harmonic oscillator and we can change the energy of this oscillator. So we can like change the spring constant as a function of time. And the way we do that is by driving a magnetic field through these Joseph's injunctions, and that turns out to change the, the sort of effective energy of the system. And what I'm going to draw here, and this is actually a, a nice animation by Andrew Eddins, who now works at IBM. Imagine I start out with like a kid on a swing, and they're swinging back and forth, but I modulate the height of this potential. So I'm like changing the spring constant of my harmonic oscillator in time. And every time this red ball is at the peak of the, its oscillation, we make the spring stiffer and it jumps up in energy and then it gets pulled down faster. So you can imagine that this is essentially adding energy to the system. And what that does is it amplifies. So if I start out with a very small oscillation and I keep bumping it up, then I get more and more amplitude and that's exactly what an amplifier does. Um, and so that's the essence of the amplifier that we're gonna use to do a quadrature measurement in this experiment. And conversely, and something that's pretty important about this is imagine if I'd started out not with the atom sitting slightly displaced, but sitting right in the middle, but with some non-zero velocity. What would happen is instead, every time the atom was at the peak, or sorry, every time this, this red ball here was at the peak, the potential would move down. This is all that, all that I did differently is I changed the phase of the oscillation. And now it actually de-amplify, which is kind of an unusual concept. Um, so what that means is that the this is an amplifier, but whether or not it amplifies depends on the phase of the incoming signal. So if I imagine starting in, if I bring in a coherent state, which I'd represent as just a, a sphere in the IQ plane, this amplifier is going to amplify one axis and squeeze another axis and actually erase information about one of the phase quadratures. And that's really important for this ability to like have a phase measurement axis that we can tune, like I talked about in the two slides ago. So without further ado, let's talk about the actual experimental system. So like I said, we have a transmon qubit sitting in a 3D superconducting cavity. We're going to induce this transmon to emit a single photon. Um, and that photon will travel down this transmission line. It goes to a Josephson parametric amplifier, which is the device that I described on the previous slide. And then through a traveling wave parametric amplifier, which just adds a little bit more gain to our system. And then we have an FPGA, which is basically a really fast piece of electronics. It's going to do all this calculation of like what's the best guess of the phase, and then what phase should I choose for my amplifier to learn as much as I can about uh, phase information. And this phase here is going to, you know, this device is going to be essentially like changing that parabolic potential that induces amplification. And this, um, so you know, there's a, there's a preferential squeezing axis set by this phase here, and there's lots of sort of digital electronics going inside that demodulates the signal, um, computes the best estimate of the phase, and then upconverts the signal to to create a pump that we can use to drive our JPA. Now there's there's a kind of neat trick that I, I think I will spend a minute to talk about, though I usually don't want to give this talk. I had a uh, I was giving you a question, but I was muted. <laughs> uh, go for it. Yeah, please. Please, like, yes. Um, could you clarify when you say loop delay 300 nanos 60 nanoseconds? Where is that from to? Hmm. So that's essentially saying from the instant that a piece of this photon hits our detector, how long is it until that signal can propagate up to our FPGA? Our FPGA calculates how it should respond to that signal and then feeds that back to the phase here. So it's kind of like the full round trip time for this feedback loop that's that's like adapting the phase based on the information. Um, okay, so uh, so that's from in the detector. When you say detector, do you mean the, the TUPA, the ADC, the, the which one? So everything. So you can imagine when the signal comes here, the, the JPA starts amplifying it. That's kind of like when the timer starts. And then imagine that electrical signal goes to the TUPA, it gets amplified, it gets digitized, goes through the FPGA, gets converted back to an analog signal, and then goes back to the JPA. So that full loop is 360 nanoseconds. Hmm. So you must have around like 80 nanoseconds from the JPA up to um to the input of the vertex of the FPJ, I guess. Mm. To be would... honest, it's a little too long since I've I've remembered the exact numbers, but I remember that the FPGA I think contributes about half of the loop delay here, roughly. Mm. Okay, yeah, that that would make sense if it's yeah about eighty nanoseconds up. Um, so it's pretty fast actually the FPGA. That's very really, very cool. Yeah, this implementation. Mm. 
Yeah, I, I'm actually glad you you bring up the loop delay thing because this turned out to be a really key part of getting this experiment to actually work in practice. Um, and it's it's the reason that we played this kind of funny trick that I'm going to describe on the next slide. But before I go on, are there any other questions? No, that's cool. Yeah, I was wondering because oftentimes some of these boards will have like just 200 nanoseconds on the digital to analog converter alone. So um, so this is this is very this is very good feedback time. It's very cool. So, you know, 360 nanoseconds is, is a lot faster than you can blink, but it actually turns out that this is a pretty prohibitively large number for doing this experiment in the naive way. So a, a trick that we had to do was we had to figure out how to make sure that the information encoded in the single is dragged out as long as possible relative to this feedback delay, um, so that this feedback delay is essentially negligible. And if you notice here, I've got this photon lasting 10 microseconds. It's actually kind of interesting how we do that. And I think the trick that we used here is, is kind of a really interesting thing that uh, is useful in all sorts of scenarios in superconducting circuits. So I'll, I'll take a second to walk through it. So the way we generate this photon isn't just exciting our qubit and letting it decay. What we do instead is we Robbie drive our qubit very quickly. So we, we get sort of an effective dressed two level system uh, with energy levels split by the Robbie frequency. We put that atom in a cavity, of course, and then we apply a sideband to this cavity, detuned by the Rabi frequency. What this does, if you imagine just like drawing out the Hilbert space of the qubit and harmonic oscillator together, is this sideband is going to drive a transition between atom in the ground in the zero state, or sorry, atom in the plus state down here, and the cavity in the zero state, with flipping the atom into the minus state and then adding a photon to the cavity. And the cavity is fairly broad, so it's going to emit a photon. Um, but then once, once the atom is sitting in the minus state, then this sideband transition is no longer resonant with anything. That's this dashed line here. And so the atom will just stay here forever. So this is kind of a simple way to sort of use microwave engineering to not only cause spontaneous emission, but control the rate. Because now I can change the amplitude of the sideband, and I can change the rate at which this qubit excitation is getting converted to a cavity excitation. And if I change the, the amplitude of the sideband as a function of time, so I can actually modulate the spontaneous emission rate during the process of spontaneous emission, I can shape the photon. So a normal qubit, if I let it just flip it up and let it decay, you know, that should give me an exponential decay. Um, and so we actually engineered our photon to be flat. And what this let us do is it let us have sort of an equal amount of information contained at all times, instead of having the information predominantly bunched at early times. Hmm. This is substantially mitigates feedback delay and also lets us tune the duration of our photon as well as shape it. Mm. And uh, I might have to slow you down here on a couple of points. So uh, can you say more about the, the tuning? So I'm guessing that the strength of the Rabi drive here is quite large compared to the tuning from the cavity. Can you say maybe a little bit more about that? Yeah, so, so in order for this sideband to address the zero plus to one minus transition, but not the zero minus to one plus transition, you need the detuning of the sideband here to be small compared to the line width of the cavity. Otherwise, you end up sort of with the sideband here, and it can drive both of those transitions. So that's what this kappa much less than omega r is. Mm -hmm. and, and do you recall the, um, the tuning that was used in, in the experiment? Yeah, so um, this, this is a trick that we've used for a number of experiments. It, le it actually lets you do a bunch of uh, pretty neat stuff. Um, for this experiment, we slowed it down to 20 megahertz. Um, so that we could have a lot of stability, because any power fluctuations in this Rabi frequency contribute to decoherence of your qubit. Mm -hmm. And then the, the cavity line width was a couple of megahertz. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we're at the point where we can start talking about like, what is what is this experimental apparatus that I've been describing for the last half hour actually do? Um, and how do we how do we see that it really is doing what we want it to do? And there, there's some kind of kind of neat in, um, intermediate steps that are worth talking about a little bit more. So before we just jump ahead to trying to do a phase measurement, let's really try to understand the physics of what happens when you do this continuous measurement process. And notice I've been emphasizing that this is a, a photon of a finite duration. It's not like you just click and it's done. It's going to arrive at our detector with some amount of time. And this means we have the ability to measure the photon for a while and then stop. Cancel the measurement halfway through, which is an instance of a weak measurement. 
So what I'm going to describe here is, is an experiment where we first prepare our item in the excited state, really the plus state, according to the, the previous slide. Maybe it was the minus state, whatever it was on top. And then we're going to cool the atom for a time duration less than the full time it takes for it to emit the photon. And then I'm going to go back and I'm going to measure the qubit. Because the qubit hasn't decayed fully, I should still find there's some residual excitation. Um, but what the state of the qubit is should depend on the measurement outcome. And, and an interesting thing you can observe is the, the final state of the atom depends on the phase of our detector, how we chose to do that measurement. So if I choose the phase of my paramp to be zero, um, that corresponds with a particular phase in the equatorial plane of the block sphere. And if I do this experiment, then I find that the qubit outcomes, they're distributed. They, they, the qubit winds up in a different place depending on how much sort of amplitude I measured in my parametric amplifier. Um, but it all lines in the same plane as the measurement axis. So what I have here is the, the circle here is the experimental observation of where we saw the qubit. And there's a little line here that connects the experimental observation to the theoretical prediction of where we thought it should end up. And if we then change the phase of our amplifier by pi over 4, 45 degrees, then we find that the qubit is distributed in a different plane. So you know the measurement actually has a very measurable effect on, on the qubit, and it actually tells something about what we were measuring in the first place. And this suggests that maybe there's a way that we can understand our detector. Because if I, if I do a homodyne measurement, just generically, I'm going to always see the, the qubit lay in, in a plane. And if I do heterodyne detection, where I now let this phase rotate rapidly in time, then the qubit can explore the entire block sphere. And I actually get a very different quantum trajectory or behavior of the system in this scenario versus this one. So what this suggests is the following. Now, if I have, you know, there's sort of these two scenarios that I emphasized earlier on in the talk. One is when the measurement axis is parallel to the best estimate of the state. Um, this is kind of the homodyne case. And if you remember, that's kind of the scenario in which I'm learning about the amplitude of the, uh, of the single that's, that's entering my detector. So I learned about how long this vector is. From the quantum trajectory standpoint, so what's, what are the dynamics of the atom when I have my measurement apparatus configured this way? That's a scenario where the atom is going to get kicked up or down. So I'm going to actually be changing the excitation probability of the qubit during the measurement process. Um, whereas if I configure things in the optimal way where the measurement axis is orthogonal to the best estimate of the state, now the measurement back action or the way that the state gets perturbed when I measure is now orthogonal to the excitation axis. So if I can measure, if I can like observe how my qubit is being disturbed by the measurement, I can actually tell if I'm acquiring photon number information or phase information. So this is kind of a, a device independent way to verify whether or not I'm doing a canonical phase measurement, because I really only want to see phase back action like this when I do a canonical phase measurement. So the actual experiment, you know, putting all this together kind of looks like this. So first out, we, we start our atom in some state, but the detector doesn't know what state the atom's in. So from its perspective, it has a, a zero length block vector. In other words, it just doesn't know what direction that arrow is pointing. And then we start the decay process, and the FPGA starts learning about the state of the photon or, or the state of the atom. Um, and that vector link starts growing. But now the FPGA is, is changing this phase axis, this red line, to try to track and keep itself orthogonal to the best estimate of the state. So this is what, actually look, what it actually looks like when we do a single shot of our adaptive phase measurement protocol. And we can, you know, based on the previous slide, can think that it's interesting to look at the different kinds of back action. So how did this blue line wiggle around during the measurement process? When I do adaptive detection, so when I try to keep the measurement axis orthogonal to the best estimate of the state, I find that if I look at a distribution of how does the theta variable or just the, you know, the cylindrical coordinate angle of my block vector get changed or kicked during the measurement process, you see that it's sort of always deviating a lot from zero. There's not like a sharp line over here like we'll see in the header nine detection case. So that suggests that you know, most of the time, the atom is experiencing a large amount of phase back action, which is exactly the scenario that you want when you're going to try to learn as much as you can about phase information. And consequently, you know, when you do a header nine detection and this axis is rotating around really quickly, there's some time when the axis is aligned, and then you don't get any phase back action. That's why there's a large frequency, uh, a large number of cases in which this d theta, this phase back action, is zero. 
So this is already subjective that adaptive dyon detection is going to measure a lot more about phase. Um, and I guess I didn't define this term, but this is just kind of a cute term that Howard uh, gave to this adaptive protocol. Howard Wiseman is one of our collaborators. Um, we can also look at the excitation probability. So just like the, you know, when the measurement axis is aligned, that should kick it up and down. So if we look at where the qubit ends up at early times, if we did a good phase measurement, then the sort of excitation probability of the atom should not be randomized at all because we never kicked it and learned something about it. And you can indeed see that in heterodyne detection, um, the, the final state of the qubit is kind of distributed as like smeared out all over the place. It did decay, so it's concentrated near the, the bottom of the block sphere. Um, but there's a lot of variance in the z-axis. Whereas in the uh, adaptive line detection case, um, you see that the dynamics are actually kind of almost confined to a ring, which shows that you know you you scrambled it a lot in the theta direction, but you really kept it confined to just a single plane as it decayed down to the ground state. And so that again suggests that we really didn't learn a lot about photon number information. And the final step is, so these are all arguments that we shouldn't have learned a lot about photon number information. We should have learned about phase, but let's actually see that it performs as we as we want it to um, by actually using it to try to do a good measurement and just, and just see how well it does, what is the noise performance. And all we have to do for that is compute the following quantity. So I've defined this variable R here. I'm gonna integrate over the duration of the photon. So I'm just integrating over the time variable that is the sort of temporal wave packet of the photon. V here is the amplifier output. It's just a, a scalar value that we can digitize. Mu is going to be the photon mode shape. So that's this flat mode that I showed you earlier in the talk. And finally, this phi variable is a complex variable that describes the phase of the parametric amplifier as a function of time and how it's rotating in response to the incoming signal. And if I compute this quantity R and I compute what is the complex phase factor of the final integrated quantity, it turns out that that is the best estimate of the phase of the photon. And so what I can do is imagine first, like what we did in this experiment, that the true phase of the photon is zero. So it's actually just zero plus one with no phase factor between the two. So a, you know, a sort of super quantum detector would always know that the phase was true and I'd get a histogram with only bins at zero. But quantum mechanics says there's a limit. I can't, I can't uh, measure a continuous variable from a qubit and get an infinite number of, an infinite amount of precision in the measurement outcome. So there's some intrinsic noise um, that comes from the photon wave packet itself. And the width of this distribution is going to tell me about how noisy is my measurement. And you know, it can never be a delta function. It can never be perfect. Um, but the narrower, the better, certainly, for a good phase measurement. And so to actually quantify this and compare different scenarios, we can compute the variance of this distribution for all of our dig different detection schemes. And the two to focus on here are this blue one, which is heterodyne detection, and this yellow one, which is this adaptive dyne detection, where we do quantum feedback on a measurement axis. And you can see we've also extracted, we kind of adjusted for loss. Um, and we want to just ask, like, you know, in terms of like fundamental, not just technical imperfections, how close are we getting to the fundamental limit allowed by quantum mechanics for doing a phase measurement? And you can see that adaptive dyne does just as well as theory predicts. And it comes, you know, very close to this fundamental quantum limit here, a lot closer than standard heterodyne detection. And actually, we can confirm that the only thing that keeps us from hitting this quantum limit here is this feedback delay that I alluded to earlier. So if we could, you know, bring the electronics down to lower, colder temperatures or slow down our photon even more, we could pull this thing arbitrarily close to the quantum limit as far as we understand. What about the effect of the quantum measurement efficiency? So that's the thing that I'm adjusting for when I say that this is an adjusted quantum limit. So I'm, I'm not going to worry about loss here. Um, oh. Loss does push this thing up. And loss contributes, so an ideal measurement, this thing, it would still be sort of a sine wave, but it would go all the way down to zero. Loss takes us up to somewhere around here. And then the feedback delay takes us a little bit higher. Mm -hmm. But at least and I guess you must also like a non-technical perspective, we consider losses like, well, the photon could have been lost before it even hit our detector. So let's not let's not hold that against our detector when we're trying to characterize it. I see. And do you have a, a sense of how much intrinsic decoherence and decay contribute as well? Yeah. Um, in terms of actual numbers, so your, your sort of phase estimation efficiency scales with the square root of your quantum efficiency. Um, and our quantum efficiency was around 0.4%. 
that doesn't end up contributing to all of the residual uncertainty because there's also some amount of decoherence of our atom during the phase emission process. So our, our atom doesn't actually have a perfectly well-defined phase, um, but it actually loses phase information as time goes on, and that contributes a little bit too. Um, but the majority, the majority of the, the loss that we see here that pushes this adjusted quantum limit above the true quantum limit is coming from that point four in the quantum efficiency. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So you know those. So those are the technical imperfections that that are important. But you know those those can be ameliorated by making better amplifiers, by using low loss or on chip circulators. There's all sorts of like engineering challenges that one can do to try to improve those things as well. And and certainly one could do a much better sort of intrinsic phase measurement than we did here if one further optimized those parameters. But as far as what's fundamentally limiting us, like I said, it's actually this feedback delay. Um, and the feedback delay is the thing that forces you to accidentally learn about photon number information when you really wanted to learn about phase information. <clears throat> and we can also characterize how much photon information we photon number information uh, we learn by just computing the absolute value of this R quantity here. And the larger R is, the larger the photon number probably was, the shorter, the, the smaller absolute value of R is, the less. And we can actually plot distributions that kind of give us a sense of how many photons were in our field. And in this experiment, there were either zero or one. Um, the solid lines I'm plotting here are histograms of what you see in the absolute value of R um, so, you know, even though I'm plotting lines here, it's a histogram just like this plot here. I just have lines so that it's easier to see. Um, and I'm plotting histograms for if I prepared the atom in zero or one, or if I prepared zero photons or one photon. And you can see that you can barely distinguish these distributions. You know, there is a slight offset between the blue and the red one. But, you know, at first glance, it almost looks like noise. Whereas compare that to heterodyne detection, where the dashed blue and red lines are, are like immediately distinguishable just by eye. I mean, you can compute like the, the mutual information stored in these things and show that there's about a factor of three less photon and mirror information encoded when you do an adaptive dyne detection. And that, that residual amount of information is entirely explained by the feedback delay, so that we don't always manage to keep our measurement axis per perfectly orthogonal. And so this is really, you know, I think fairly convincing evidence that we're not learning about information that we don't want to learn about. And that's the real reason why adaptive dyne detection is doing better than heterodyne detection here. So to conclude with kind of the, you know, the main gist of all of this is we started out, you know, trying to measure what are making all the best detectors we can for, for optical fields. We have photon number detectors, which can measure power at the fundamental limit. We have quadrature detectors like paramps, which are fantastic for measuring field amplitudes. And now we're at least at the beginning stages of having a device that can measure phase at the optimal limits allowed by quantum mechanics or performing this canonical phase measurement. But I think there's there's actually a lot of other interesting applications of continuous measurement. Um, and, and some of them hopefully leave open some room for improving upon this canonical phase measurement in some more fundamental ways. Um, now, continuous measurement is, like I've kind of alluded to, something that's that's kind of universal. It's, it's especially amenable to, to being studied in superconducting circuits because you get these really high quantum efficiencies. This is uh, Zlatko's question right at the end where um, you know, a quantum efficiency of 0.4, like I said, it's, that goes from zero to one, is, is maybe not a huge number, but it's actually extraordinarily high compared to a lot of atomic systems. And it allows us to do all sorts of neat experiments that are, are very difficult to do in many other experimental platforms. Um, and since measurement is so important for so many um, technologies and concepts that we have in quantum mechanics, bringing high efficiency and continuous measurement to those concepts should also lead to more new capabilities, in my opinion. So people use measurement to create remote entanglement. This is the way that people did the first loophole-free Bell's inequality violation. And there's, there's some nice examples where continuous measurement kind of lets you do those schemes even better. Um, error correction is, is like a very important part of quantum information processing. And there's lots of proposals to try to bring continuous measurement to the error correction protocol to try to optimize it by using this fact that you can do measurements continuously. And then from a more fundamental physics perspective, you know, I, I talked today about doing a canonical phase measurement, but if you notice, I only ever let my photon have zero, or my, my um, optical wave packet have zero or one photons. And it turns out that we still don't actually know um, using sort of reasonable resources, 
how do you do a canonical phase measurement if that input state could be anything, if it could have 100 photons? Um, but I think there's a chance that if we, if we understand continuous measurements and adaptive measurements better, and we may be bringing in some of the, the neat tools that superconducting circuits have, like strong photon nonlinearities, that it might be possible not only to generate an ideal canonical phase measurement that applies to any input state, but actually to generate like an arbitrary quantum mechanical measurement operator. And this is where some of the, the unique strengths of superconducting circuits come in that I didn't even use throughout this talk, which is the fact that we have some crazy strong photon nonlinearities in superconducting circuits. Um, so, you know, not only that allows people to make these really cool nonlinear transmission lines to make tupas, but if we add even stronger nonlinearities, maybe we can do like quantum circuit processing on, on optical or, or photonic modes. Um, can we use like EIT to capture photonic modes as they're traveling and then do computations on those instead of being restricted to a couple simple devices like parametric amplifiers that we can build? So I think superconducting circuits especially has a, a really interesting and bright future for um, understanding the fundal, fundamental limits of measurements and, and hitting them whenever that's possible. So that's my outlook. And I want to conclude um, by thanking all of the wonderful people I got to work with over the years. Um, some of these people are actually now at IBM, including Andrew Eddins and David Toiley, who are really great people to work with. Um, William Livingston was kind of a really important part of running this experiment. He, he programmed the field programmable gate array and had a lot of really, really neat ideas that made this experiment possible. Shea cohen Gorgi did a lot of fabrication, Irfan Siddiqui, the support and mentorship. Um, and also Howard Wiseman was the person who proposed this to us uh, several years ago and had an original paper from 1995 that first proposed this adaptive dime protocol. Um, and we were very fortunate to actually get to work with him directly when uh, working on this project. He's one of our co-authors. Um, and finally, thank you to all of you for attending the IBM seminar, especially on Thanksgiving. And I'm really happy to take any questions you have. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lee. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in uh, to this uh, awesome experiment and results. Um, and I think um, maybe you can begin with a question about how this might extend to coherent states, for instance, uh, this type of, uh, oh, and by the way, I should mention from the chat here, there are a few very nice comments uh, from people like Josh Combs saying, you know, great talk. So I thought I would relate that to you since you can't see the chat. <laughs> nice. Yeah, so the scheme, so we're asking about coherent states. And so this scheme actually has been uh, implemented on coherent states. It doesn't turn out that it lets you do a canonical phase measurement in that case. Um, and Howard's shown that if you're only allowed sort of the resources of linear optics, um, there doesn't seem to be a way to do a canonical phase measurement on an input coherent state. Now, that's not to say that an adaptive measurement isn't useful for doing a good phase, me phase measurement. And it turns out that um, these adaptive schemes that I showed here, there are sort of variants of them that let you measure the phase of a coherent state better than if you just did homodyne or heterodyne detection. Um, but they're still, they're still a long ways away from the canonical phase measurement which I think leaves open the exciting question of, um, you know, what 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 are the minimal resources that it would take to do a, a canonical phase measurement on an arbitrary input state or even on some subset of coherent states? And uh, is there some intuition as to why the scheme doesn't generalize to coherent states? It's a really good question. Um, I actually asked Howard this at one point. Um, and the, the sense that I have is that essentially a, a, a single photon or a superposition of a zero and one photons really only has one phase, phase variable in it. And that's the coherence between the zero state and the one state. Um, when you even add a single extra photon, so if I have zero, one, or two photons, then you know if I write down the wave function of that state, there's the phase between zero and one, but there's also the phase between one and two. And you know, if I want to pick a measurement axis, well, which one do I choose? Is it the phase between zero and one, the one between one and two, um, maybe an average of the two? And as I add in that more and more pho um, photons, then there's more and more possibilities. And it just doesn't become obvious if they're, you know, sort of what the optimal phase would be. And it turns out that just picking one of them, one of them doesn't, doesn't work. There's essentially sort of too much information that you could cram into a single quadrature measurement. Mm, okay. Yeah. Interesting. I guess for a coherent state, the, I think the phase of each photon uh, scales with n uh, is the power. Yeah, it scales linearly with n. Um, yeah. So you might you might kind of hope that 
in that case, where sort of the phase space, you know, the phase difference between consecutive levels is somehow equal, uh, that it would work out, but it just doesn't work out. <laughs> Interesting. Um, and a question from Josh, uh, Josh Combs, the feedback delay decreases the performance of the measurement. So what limits the scheme to increase the length of your rectangular photon wave packet? Yeah, so um, I, I briefly alluded to this. So in some of our earlier work, we used this, this sort of dress qubit picture in these sideband schemes. Um, and it's nice to be able to drive your qubit as, as hard as you can for those schemes. But uh, high powers, where you're driving lots and lots of oscillations means there's a chance for the, the final phase of your qubit to depend strongly on the amplitude of that drive. So if, you're, if there are fluctuations in your Rabi power, um, that translates to a lot of qubit decoherence. And essentially, that was what was limiting the duration of our photon was. We turned down the, the Rabi frequency as much as we could, but ultimately, power fluctuations limit the, the phase stability of your qubit Rabi oscillations at long times. Hmm. We didn't, we didn't really try to go longer than 10 microseconds, but I think we didn't really dare either. Mm -hmm. And I guess you're running into T1 and T2 as well. Yeah, T2 can get nice and long when you're when you're Robbie driving. And so it's this effective T2 that starts to really come in before your fundamental T2. Oh, interesting. And uh, you presented these nice plots. This is a question from Josh again. You presented these nice plots that showed the approximate indistinguishability of 0 and 1 for the phase measurement. Do you think, uh, did you think about doing tomography of the phase POVM? I think yeah, so that was. Yeah, that was actually kind of the original motivation for um, some of these slides that I showed back. And I guess we never explicitly reconstructed the POVM, though we, we actually could have done that just given the data we already have. Could just, just doing tomography on your qubit um, when stopping the measurement is enough to reconstruct sort of what was the POVM up to some point in time. Um, and then... Yeah, and then I guess you could also, you know, you might also like prepare lots of different states and, and reconstruct it that way. We, we never actually did that, but we figured that the, the distributions of the R and sort of um, reconstructing the POVM up to a given point in time are already told us a lot. Uh, like, I think this, this ring structure you can actually think of as, as mapping over to sort of the variance in your POVM for photon number, sort of how much photon number information it's learning. Mm -hmm. There is like a one-to-one -one mapping between that variance and the, the actual operators themselves. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, thank you for that answer. And if there are any final questions, folks, please feel free to post them in the chat. Um, and otherwise, I think that will get us one step closer uh, to thanking Lee. And actually, oh, I did have one more question I forgot to ask, by the way. Uh, sure. if, in terms of making the experiment possible, so I think you alluded to this already, what was the most challenging part yeah, so there were there were a couple of things. I mean, one was the so just getting hundreds of coherent Rabi oscillations actually involved a lot of like room temperature feedback to stabilize that. Um, so that was one thing, uh, and then there was a lot of a lot of playing around with different parametric amplifiers to make sure that this device was stable when you were changing the phase and adapting. It turns out that you know I I, I really didn't talk at all about this during the talk, but. When you have a parametric amplifier, which is a fairly complicated nonlinear device, you're applying a lot of power to it, and you start trying to play with the phase as a function of time. Um, if if the device doesn't have the right properties, if it doesn't have a nice large bandwidth, um, you end up needing you end up creating lots of complicated non uh, instabilities. And, and honestly, there were some that showed up that we never managed to fully understand. Um, but you you at least want to be in a limit where you're not pumping the parent too hard. Um, so we had the amplifier, you know, we turn down the gain, we make one that's nice and wide. This is a somewhat unconventional parametric amplifier in terms of its parameter regime. And then one reason why we followed it up with the tupa was that uh, this way you can, uh, you can operate the parametric amplifier with lower gain, but still have a very high quantum efficiency amplifier afterward that uh, mm -hmm. you know, converts that signal to something that you can deal with it uh, at room temperature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah, I'd say the, there's there are a lot of subtleties in getting a nonlinear amplifier to actually handle having the phase of its pump being sort of randomly scrambled as a function of time. Hmm. Interesting. 
Okay, and and the stability of the drive, the oscillation. You mean this was a question of of sort of stabilizing the phase of your L, of the control on that, or uh, uh, for the for the Robbie oscillations? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's just a matter of you know, can you hold a room temperature microwave power as constant as possible as a function of time? Um, and we wound up, we did a little bit of like classical it's feedback. Like second period, right? It, it only matters what the phases of lock because it's self-locked to itself from the start of the experiment again, which is just, I guess, a 10 microsecond time. Um, yeah, and so, I mean, if that were a phase, you know, electronic devices are, are pretty good yeah. holding phases constant, um, but it's because the power fluctuations of that drive are what contribute to decoherence. That's actually something that's a much nastier beast to deal with. Interesting. Um, and there's, not only are there sort of overall power fluctuations, which you can feed back on, but um, you know some of these devices, if you look carefully, they have little transients. So it might not be outputting a constant power as a function of time. And then you actually have to map out how is your qubit winding, how is the Robbie frequency going as a function of time and compensate for that in various ways that can also drift. Hmm. Uh, so these are, these are like annoying technical things that you normally don't uh, talk about except in the supplemental materials of your paper. Yeah, no, but it's you know practically very important. So was the answer? So do you remember what kind of source this was, like a lab break or or a key site? Uh... Um, yeah. So I mean, we had we had generators from different companies. So I don't remember which one we were using for the qubit drive, but you know, it's the generator, it's the IQ mixer, and and you know, IQ mixers are diodes, and diodes are very temperature sensitive. So any small room temperature this will actually change the amount of, um, mm -hmm. you know conversion that you get to your your um, sidebands. Um, and then the the transients we attributed potentially to the amplifiers, because you, you need a lot of power to drive these things. And so after you create the sidebands, you have amplifiers to ramp that up to get 20 megahertz. And mm -hmm. those amplifiers also have their own their own like temperature dependencies and also instabilities that you have to deal with. Mm -hmm. All right, Lee. Well, I think uh, that was a very detailed and good answers. Uh, lots of good questions during the talk. Uh, I know we're running about 10 minutes over. So I think uh, unless there are any final comments or questions from your the audience, I'd like to thank you. And I'd like to thank uh, yeah, you me. folks for tuning in today on Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving again to those of you uh, in the Northeast North region. And uh, Lee, thank you for accepting our invitation. This talk will stay live, so you can always go back and rewatch it on the Kiskid YouTube channel. And otherwise, we will see you next Friday at noon Eastern time. I will have a colleague uh, sit in for me that time. So thank you, Lee. Thank you, everyone. It was a pleasure. We'll see you next week. Thank you.